Good to be in God's house. Amen. Amen. Today's the first day I felt decent since, man, probably Saturday. I was not feeling good Saturday. Sunday was awful. Uh, Monday, even yesterday, I wasn't feeling the best. Went home yesterday afternoon, went to bed for a while, and, and then started feeling a little bit better. So today I recorded two hours worth of Watchmen video. So Lindsay will have fun editing that. So anyway, I appreciate everybody's prayers and everything like that. And um, those of you who are still battling whatever it is, uh, may the Lord bless you, and I hope that God makes you feel better. Um, let's get our Bibles out. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. We'll start with Mark. Um, and sorry about not being here last Wednesday. I forgot to let you guys know. Put this in your calendar. July... The week of, look, somebody look, when's, it'll be, we're, Lisa and I are going to be out of town the week, Wednesday the 17th, we'll not be here. So write that down, Wednesday the 17th. Um, Lisa and I are going to Alaska. No. Unless Joe takes you. Then, then you can go. And for those of you who have never been, I've never been, so when I get back, I'll tell you how awful it was. All right? So, but uh, yeah, it'll be our 32nd wedding anniversary, uh, July 10th. So, and then July 11th, we're going to leave and go to Seattle and see Mount Rainier, and then we're going to head north into Alaska. So, pray for us. But on that Wednesday night, we'll not be here. All right? Anyway... Been a while, so let's get our Bibles out and let's study God's Word. Mark chapter 8, we're studying the principal doctrines, the foundation doctrines, what it is that Christians believe. And there's a lot of things that are common amongst um, most, I would say most Christians believe some of the same things about God and about Jesus Christ. Now, we went through all the attributes of God. And um, what, I, what I may do uh, as part of this, when, now that we're dealing with Jesus Christ, who is Jesus Christ? We will deal, as part of this, we will deal with the divinity of Christ. Christ is God. It's what we believe. Um, and I was thinking about this earlier, Wayne, um, I was watching a YouTube video about a woman and she said she prayed to St. George. I didn't even know there was a St. George. But she prayed to a saint by the name of St. George for some kind of help. And I went, you know what that is? God said, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Now, we pray to Jesus, but he's God. So if you are praying to a saint what you're doing is you're placing a God between you and God. And God said, no, don't do that. There, you shall have no other gods before me. And that's what's happening. They're, they've put somebody before they get to God. They put somebody as like an intermediary. Not even Mary is that. Amen. So uh, we will, as part of this study, we'll look at the deity of Christ. Does the Bible say, does it say it, that Jesus is God? And so that'll be part of this study. And then once you settle that, then the attributes of God the Father then would be applied to God the Son. If God is eternal, then so is the Son. If God the Father is all-powerful, then so is Jesus Christ. In fact, Jesus said, all power is given to me in heaven and earth. So that establishes that there. So once you settle the idea that Jesus is God, then all the attributes that we studied about God would equally apply to Jesus Christ. But let's read Mark chapter 8 and um, verse 27, 28, 29. We'll go to the Lord in prayer. Jesus went out and his disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi. 
And by the way, he asked his disciples, saying unto them, Whom do men say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. But some say, Elias or Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. And he saith unto him, But whom say ye that I am? And Peter answereth and saith unto him, Thou art the Christ. Thou art the Christ. Heavenly Father, we ask God that you open up our eyes and our minds and our hearts tonight. As we study your word, Father, fill us with knowledge that maybe we already know, but Father, we bring these things back to our minds. We, these are things that we believe. These are things, Father, that we could be able to teach to someone else who doesn't know. And I thank, dear God, that we are living in a time in this country where too many people don't know who Jesus is. And they need somebody to tell them. And I pray, dear God, that you would just fill our minds and our hearts with the knowledge that our church is built upon the rock of Jesus Christ and who is Christ. So teach us from your word tonight things that you're going to remind us of or maybe something that we have never thought of before, never read before, never known before. But Father, we ask God that from the oldest to the youngest that you would be our teacher tonight as we go through the scriptures Bless your word, bless these that have come either by way of this building or those that are with us on the internet. We pray, God, that you'd bless each and every one of us. And we thank you, God, for your mercy and your kindness to us. We love you in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. amen. By the way, Michael uh, should have gotten on a plane about an hour ago. Yay! John, you act like you hate your job up there. And um, so he's headed back to America. I posted on our, uh, uh, let's see, where did I put those? I put them on Facebook, and I also put them on my blog, PastorMikeHoggard.com, all the pictures that Michael has sent me of those four children that God has uh, blessed our lives with. And um, I, every time I look at them, I just kind of get misty-eyed when I see how God... Just, God loves these kids. There's no doubt in my mind about it. And um, so it just, you know, it just, it makes me happy uh, to see their faces. So I uh, appreciate everybody that's prayed, that's uh, chipped in a little bit. Appreciate that. And um, I'm sure Michael will have a lot more uh, to tell us once he gets back. So be praying for him. All right, let's look at Jesus as the husband. Turn to Genesis chapter 2. Um, as you're turning there to Genesis 2, let me read something to you out of the book of Psalms that just came to my mind. This just in from heaven. Uh, in Psalm chapter 2, we see that there is actually a conspiracy against God. If you believe in conspiracies, conspiracy actually is a crime. Conspiracy to commit murder, conspiracy to commit fraud, those are actual crimes. People actually get together and they secretly work out details of how they're going to do something that's bad. Well, there are crazy conspiracy theories and then there's what the Bible says that men are trying to do. And in Psalm chapter 2... The, the Bible says, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. That's a conspiracy. When rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, that's a conspiracy. You have more than one person involved sitting together saying, how can we destroy God? How can we go against God? We know in the book of Revelation, the battle of Armageddon, that last great battle on the earth, involves the kings of the earth that, have, that are meeting with the Antichrist and the false prophet to meet Jesus in the valley of Megiddo to try to do battle against God. Who do they think they are? thinking they can defeat God. God who can speak things into existence 
can also speak things out of existence if he wants. He has power with the words of his mouth. And these kings and these rulers think they can destroy God. They're wrong. But look at what their target is. Verse 3, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. What I wear on my finger is a wedding band. It is what it is a symbol of what unites me to my sweetie pie. I wear it. I wear it every day. I wear it proudly. I don't take it off around certain people. I don't hide it. I'm married. I'm thankful that I'm married. And I believe God dealt with me years ago about marriage, about my marriage, about my attitude and my life and my role as her husband. God, and God still deals with me about being a better husband, being a better head of the family, being better at what I do, being uh, more attentive to my wife, loving my wife more, not being bitter against her like the Bible says. But God dealt with me about my role in marriage and I'm here to tell you that God is pro marriage God and f and not just marriage the way the Supreme Court has defined marriage the way the state of Missouri defined marriage if you remember that vote we voted 80 percent of the people of the state of Missouri said that it's in our constitution that marriage is one man with one woman. That's it. But the Supreme Court said, it doesn't matter what 80% of the people of the state of Missouri said. We'll do what we want to. God wrote all that down, people. They've attacked God. And understand this. Before there was ever a city... And before there was ever a church, there was a wedding on earth where God brought a woman that he made specifically for Adam, his creation, brought her to him and joined those two together. God himself brought Adam and Eve together, joined them together. But so before there was before there was a before there was a music concert, before there was a city, before there was a church. Before there was a book written, before there was anything on this earth, as far as human civilization goes, there was a husband and a wife together. That was God's idea, not man's. And think about it, universally, every culture. I mean, here we have a family from Korea. Marriage between a man and a wife has existed in Korea for thousands of years. Even before Christianity came to Korea, they were marrying each other. Where did they get that idea from? They got it from God. God is the one who established that. So, Genesis chapter 2. Uh, I want you to notice something. As God is creating everything in Genesis 1, and God saw that it was good, and God saw that it was God, and God created the light he said let there be light and God saw the light that it was good everything about his creation God says is good but then he gets to man that he has created the, the the pinnacle of God's creation on this earth was Adam and God says about Adam it is not good that the man should be alone he looks at all of creation and for the monkeys God made a male and a female. For the dogs, he made a male and a female. For chickens, he made a male and a female. For the flies, well, he kind of got them kind of mixed up a little bit. But for everything else in the world, even tomato plants, there's a male and a female. Okay, flowers, there's a male and a female. Bees, there's a male and a female. So God looks at man and he says, it's not good that the man should be alone. I will make him help meet. And that word meet means sufficient for his needs what what that man is missing in his life i will supply to him but he's going to have to have a wife to get it from think about so i mean think about then the importance of a woman in a man's life i am not and the way 
uh, it actually, Brady Crum actually kind of helped me with this because I never really thought about it. But the actual qualification for a bishop or a pastor for church is he must be the husband of one wife. And Brady said, I don't see how a man could be a pastor unless he's a husband. And I went, I never thought about that. I'm glad I got married first, you know. But anyway, that was the qualification. Why? Because it's not good that I do this all on my own. It's not good that I go through life by myself. It's not good that I be alone in my life. So God gave me a wife. So then, in verse 21, the Lord caused a deep sleep. And what you're seeing here, remember who Adam is. According to Luke chapter 3, the lineage that we're given in Luke of the lineage of Jesus Christ, he says, Jesus, as was supposed the son of Joseph, who was the son of Heli, who was the son of this. And then it goes all the way down, Enos, who was the son of Adam, who was the son of God. It actually says Adam was the son of God. So Adam is a foreshadow. He's a type of Jesus Christ. We have the first man, we have the second Adam. So what you're seeing here is a picture of Christ and his church. The Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. Sleep is a picture of death. Christ died for us and he slept, took one of his ribs, closed up the flesh instead thereof, a wound in his side. Think about that. The rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And when I do a wedding ceremony, this is what I do. The, the groom stands next to me and it's the father of the bride, traditionally, that brings the bride down. And I say these words, who brings this woman to be married to this man? And the father will say, her mother and I do. So then, the, the father then will give his daughter to that man. And that's where they join together. And that is right from your Bible. That's where that comes from. In fact, even, look in Genesis 5, even the reason why the wife takes the man's name and not the other way around. And I, do, I don't like it. People try to mess things up. So now you have men who are taking the last name of the wife, or you have men taking the last name of the other man. That's just, that's wrong. Because look in Genesis 5. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the, in the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him, male and female created he them, and he blessed them and called their name, what? Adam. This is Mr. and Mrs. Adam. She took his name. That's from the Bible. That's how it's supposed to be. So anyway, so the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh thereof and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. You notice that the word man is in the word woman. Even in the Hebrew, I don't know much Hebrew, but I just happen to know that the Hebrew here, I think for Adam or the man is ish and the Hebrew for woman is isha. If I remember right, you go to blueletterbible.org ORG and look that up, but I think that's, if I remember right, that's how it is. So even in the Hebrew, it's still, the, the woman is still called after the man's name because she was taken out of man. Therefore, shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife. That's what I was trying to convey Sunday morning uh, when I wasn't doing so well, is that God said, if you love me, you'll cleave unto the Lord your God. You'll be like a husband and a wife together and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. How literal is that? Well, we know what happens. After this takes place, usually about nine months later, there is a child that's born. And that child literally 
is the one flesh made of the two. Father contributes 23 chromosomes. Mother contributes a matching 23 chromosomes. And when that child is first conceived, those chromosomes together, join together to literally write out every member of that child's body from the moment of conception. I hate it when they try to tell you that life begins at birth. It doesn't. It begins at conception. Can I hear somebody say amen? amen. That DNA does not belong. That DNA is unique now to that human being. And they do a DNA test of that child. He has his own set of chromosomes, his own DNA that matches him alone. Now he has traits of mom and traits of dad. But to say that that thing in that woman's body is part of that woman's body, scientifically it doesn't match. It's not. It's its own unique individual. So the Bible literally means what it says here. So now what this is, is turn to Ephesians chapter 5. This is a picture then of who Jesus is. Ephesians chapter 5. This is where a passage that preachers don't preach out of anymore because it's not politically correct. It's not very acceptable in our culture anymore to say that the husband is the head of the household. It's not acceptable anymore, but that doesn't change the Bible. I'm not going to change the Bible. And... Um, the whole purpose of a marriage. I mean, why don't we just be animals and mate with whoever or whatever we want because we're not animals. We're not. And I, I mean, I can remember guys in high school arguing against marriage saying, yeah, when I see dogs going around, I don't see a ring on their finger. We're not dog. Well, I'm not. I mean, if man is going to be reduced to a beast, then he doesn't need a wedding band. But as long as we're humans created in the image of God, we need a wedding band. Amen? Responsibility goes along with the joys of marriage. Amen? Responsibility. Ephesians 5, verse... I think God made this unique. He made us above animals, beasts, brutes. He made us to live above their level. Okay? But I'll tell you this. Even in the animal kingdom, some animals mate for life. They pick one mate, and it's their mate for life, okay? So even in the animal kingdom, and by the way, even animals know the difference between male and female, okay? They, I mean, it may be reduced to smell, but they know the difference. So Ephesians 5, for this cause, he's quote, Paul's quoting Genesis 2. This is... The New Testament sanctioning how God created this. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife. And they too, by that, that's what the word cleave means. The Bible's got a built-in dictionary. The word cleave means joined. Shall be joined unto his wife and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. So Christ is the husband. He's the man. The church the soul of each one of us is that bride. The soul of each one of us is that woman, that bride, that church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself and the wife see that she reverence her husband. I mean, this church, Christ does not belong to us. We belong to him. This is his body, his church. He is the one who tells us how things are going to be because he's the head and we are of his body. 
Each one of us together, we are part of him. Now, but think about what God said. God said to the son of God, Adam, it's not good that the man should be alone. Now you think about what God's saying here. God has a son, Jesus Christ. And he says of his son, it's not good you should be alone. I will make and help meet for him. And think about it. When Jesus came to this earth, he called forth his disciples. And he set about to establish what is and will become the kingdom of God on this earth. And Jesus then does not do what he's doing, what he did or what he's going to do. He's not doing it all by himself. He has chosen to include his bride in what he's doing. I mean, think about the picture of you have King Ahasuerus. And he's ruling over what amounts to millions of people. But he's not doing it by himself. He's not doing it alone. He has a wife named Esther who is counseling him. And Esther appears because Ahasuerus got bad counsel from Haman that we should kill all the Jews. Well, Esther's a Jew. That means she would have been killed. And Esther goes to her husband, the king, and says, what you're doing is not right. Because if you kill them, you're going to have to kill me because I'm a Jew. And I found out that Haman has set this up for you and God's going to destroy this town if you kill all of us Jews. Ahasuerus listened to the counsel of his wife and changed his mind. She was the one that showed him the conspiracy and he changed his mind. Think about Abigail. Before Abigail ended up being the wife of David, she ends up going to David. David, who is seeking help from Naboth, and Naboth says, I don't know who David is and I don't care. I'm not helping him and I'm not feeding his soldiers. I don't care nothing about him. He can go die for all I care about. And when David heard about it, David grabbed 400 guys and said, we're going to go kill that guy and everybody living in his house. And when Abigail found out about it, she went to David. She bowed before him and she prayed to David. David, don't kill him. Because if you go and kill them, you'll end up killing me. And I don't want to die. So David, would you please reconsider? David put his sword back in his sheath and he said, you know what? I would have been foolish to do what I was about to do, but you changed my mind. So I'm going to listen to what you said and go on your advice. And God ended up killing Naboth, her wicked, evil husband, and Abigail and David gets hitched. Okay? I mean, you have all these examples in the Bible of how this woman even though she wasn't in charge, she counseled properly the man who was her husband or who would end up being her husband, and that husband listened to her. Amen. Amen. And think about it. Jesus is God. He's sovereign. He can do whatever he wants. Yes. But who's he listening to? Yes. He listens to us when we pray. Because we have things that concern us and bother I mean... When we wanted to be saved, we asked Jesus to save us. We didn't demand it. We didn't put our foot down and say, you better save me or I'll be a living terror to you. That's not how it happened. We were bawling our eyes out when we asked God. I remember I was nine years old, crying my eyes out. I didn't understand why I was crying, but I was crying. Why? Because I didn't want to go to hell. And I was asking Jesus to save me. I didn't understand then what I know now. But what I know now is I'm part of the church that asks our husband Jesus for help and to do things for us and we are going to end up being part of his kingdom when Jesus comes back he's not coming back alone he's bringing ten thousands of his saints with him and that's his church the bride who is going to help Jesus rule even ruling over angels the Bible says we're going to judge angels Okay, so this great mystery here is Christ and his church. It's not good that Jesus is alone. And God right now is preparing a bride for his son. And God's picked a good one. Amen. Uh, you have stories of that. Think of uh, Abraham. Abraham called forth 
his servant, uh, what was his name? Can't remember. But it, this is where Abraham said, put your hand under my thigh and you're going to swear an oath. I'm going to send you out to find a bride for my son. And that's a picture of the Holy Spirit going out, gathering in the bride for, for the son of Abraham. That's how that's done. Okay? And I could go in all night for that. Turn to Romans chapter 5. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. That's not my notes. Hang on. Those are not my notes. Where's my notes at? I got to have my notes. Hang on one second. Don't turn to Romans 5, whatever you do. Those are the wrong ones. Hang on a second. I got to change Wi-Fi and how in the world did that happen? Uh, let's see here. Where am I going to tell you to go now? Uh, let's see here. Turn to Isaiah 54 while I'm trying to find where my, my real notes are. Hang on. Come on. Where did I tell you to go? Isaiah 54. And I mean it. Go to Isaiah 54. Let's see here. We're going to close that. And we're going to open up another one. But it better be the one that I made. That one. That's the one I want. Is that, is that it? Is that the notes? Yes! Got it. All right. Turn to Jeremiah. Hold your place at Isaiah 54. Turn to Jeremiah. Lindsay's editing job's not going to be easy tomorrow. I can tell you that. She's downstairs listening to me. All right. So now I do that. And that. And that. And that. And this. And that. And that. All right. Jeremiah. Is that where I told you? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Jeremiah 31. Where in the world was I thinking there? Yeah, I guess that'll work. Jeremiah 31, and I'll read Psalm 19. Their line is gone, Psalm 19, beautiful chapter, by the way, it starts out, The heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament showeth his handiwork, day unto day utter his speech, night unto night showeth knowledge, there's no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. And in verse 4, their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world, in them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His goings forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it. There's nothing hid from the heat thereof. And here, it's calling the son a bridegroom. Well, now think about that. Malachi chapter 4 says that Jesus is the son, capital S-U-N, of righteousness, arising with healing in his wings. Matthew chapter 17, Jesus is transfigured, his face shining as the sun. The book of Isaiah says the Lord is the Lord God is a sun and a shield to them. And in, in Revelation chapter 1, when John turns around to see Jesus, his countenance is shining like the sun. And Jesus said, I am the light of the world. So the sun here in Psalm 19, the Bible says, is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. So where does the sun rise? What direction? East. Where's Jesus coming from? He's coming from the east. You go to these old cemeteries. Do they still bury people facing east? I know in the old ones they did. Everybody in America back in the old days didn't know better if you were saved or not. You were going to face east. When you, would, you were not going to have your back turned to Christ on resurrection day. Because when he comes, he's coming from the east. Just like the sun, he's the bridegroom coming out of his chamber. When he comes, he can't, he's running. He can't wait to meet his wife. Amen. Uh, yeah, I, I was a little happy about getting married. I was. Really, I was. I've enjoyed it. Amen. <laughs> Jeremiah 31. I have no idea why I had you go there, but that's in my notes, so we'll read it. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of, oh, this is why, out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. Jesus is the husband. 
He was a husband to Israel, the Old Testament, and Israel repeatedly broke the marital covenant. God said, even though I was a husband to them, she repeatedly went whoring after other gods. God put up with it in the days of Moses. God put up with it in the days of the judges. He put up with it in the days of the kings. And finally, by the time you have Manasseh, king of of Judah and other kings, by the time these guys come around, you end up 42 kings over Israel and Judah, and God finally says, I'm writing you a bill of divorce. I've had all of the whoring that I'm going to take from you. And God cut them off. And that's what he's saying. Even though I was a husband to the house of Israel, she repeatedly broke those marital bonds. And even God had to say, I'm done. I'm not going to do it anymore. I can only imagine what somebody goes through when they have a cheating spouse and they just continue and continue and continue in that until finally they have to say, I can't do this anymore. You're gone. And that's what God did to Israel. Cut them off. Wrote them a bill of divorce. I was her husband. But she kept cheating on me. So verse 33 says, This shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. Um, the book of Hosea, we're not going to look at this tonight, but very briefly, the book of Hosea is about that very thing. Hosea was told by God to marry a whore, a harlot, by the name of Gomer. And Hosea, naturally, he's going to do what God says, but Hosea actually fell in love. He actually loved her. So he does what God said. God is going to show a picture of what he's doing here. So he tells Hosea, go marry Gomer, and he marries Gomer. But Gomer doesn't change. And Gomer keeps stepping out repeatedly on Hosea. And Hosea knows it. And then he's got these kids that I don't, from what I can see, that they're not Hosea's kids. The children of whoredoms. And Hosea knows it. But he ends up, Gomer's gone. Can't find her anywhere. Turns out, she is being sold in the slave market. And Hosea, he had a right to just put her out. But that's not what he did. He went and he paid the price for her. Even though she was already his wife. He went and purchased her. This time, when he brings her to himself, she's different. Now she's ready to stay with him. And he makes a new woman out of her. Now you think about this. Each one of us was Gomer. Okay, we went out and did things against God we should have never done, but we did anyway. And God gave us the chance to come to him. Amen. Amen. He did it because he loves us. It's not logic. It's love. It's why he did what he did. Okay? And that's, by the way, that's, we're talking about Jesus here. Okay? Turn to Ezekiel 16. 
Ezekiel 16, if you've never read it, I want to encourage you to do it. It's a beautiful chapter about Jerusalem as a city. And Jerusalem is, starts out a young woman, a girl, teenager. And God said, I fell in love with you. And I found you, you were born, but you were cast aside. God said, I cleaned you up cut the umbilical cord, and then as you grew, I adorned you. I gave you jewels, and I gave you earrings, and I gave you a beautiful garment. I dressed you. I, I, I made you who you are. But then you took that and you used that to be a harlot to all the nations around you. So in Ezekiel 16, verse 30, How weak is thine heart, saith the Lord? Seeing thou doest all these things, the work of an imperious, whorish woman, and that thou buildest thine imminent place in the head of every way, and makest thine high place in every street, and hast not been as an harlot, in that thou scornest higher. But as a wife that committeth adultery, which taketh strangers instead of her husband, that's what Jerusalem did. That's Israel of old and Israel now. That she went out committing adultery and took strangers instead of her husband. And her husband was God. They give gifts to all whores, but thou givest thy gifts to all thy lovers. And hirest them that thou may come unto thee on every side for thy whoredom. She's, and I won't say this too much, but she went beyond what a prostitute does. She didn't take their money. She gave her money to them. That's what he's saying. And apparently God's saying that's the worst kind right there. So God had to cut it off with Israel. But he's going to take her back one of these days. Okay? He's not done. Now turn to Isaiah. Now you can turn to Isaiah. Isaiah. And Jeremiah. I mean, just let's hang around here for a while. Mm -mm -mm. Isaiah, in fact, if you want to turn to Jeremiah 33, I'll go to, I'll read Isaiah 62. For as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. And as the bridegroom rejoiceth over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. I'll say this publicly. I couldn't believe I ended up with Lisa Leonard. I couldn't believe it. Because she was, she was pretty. Way over my league, I thought. God brought us together is all I can say. I hope she's as happy with her geeky husband as I am with her because she was just doggone pretty. Still is. She's taken me to Alaska. That's how good she is. She don't like the cold. And I love it. So. Yeah. She's way over my league. So I, I was rejoicing. I watched a guy. I, she, she came to visit me in Bible college. And I watched a guy that I went to college with. He was checking her out. And I'm going, yeah, that's mine. I was, I was tickled. Anyway, as, as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. You know what Jesus is not? Jesus is not ashamed of his church. He's not ashamed. Because he has made us what we are and what we will be. Somebody say amen. amen. Okay? And he's not going to be ashamed of who he married. Jeremiah 33, verse 9. It shall be to me a name of joy, a praise and an honor before all the nations of the earth, which shall hear all the good that I do unto them. They shall fear and tremble for all the goodness and for all the prosperity that I procure unto it. Thus saith the Lord, again, 
There shall be heard in this place, which ye say shall be desolate without man and without beast, even the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem. Listen, I want to tell you something. To, to this day, there are leagues of Arabs who want to wipe Jerusalem and every Jew off the globe. Don't they, Brother George? They want to slaughter every one of them. Yasser Arafat would lie to his teeth and make some kind of deal with whoever was the prime minister of Israel and then go back to the Palestinians and say, we're not going to done until we've driven every Jew into the Mediterranean Sea. They hate them over there. And so look at this. God's saying, yeah, they want to wipe you off the map, but I'm telling you, I'm going to make you prosper there. Okay? Verse 11. The voice of joy. The voice of gladness. The voice of the bridegroom. And the voice of the bride, the voice of them that shall say, Praise the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good, for his mercy endureth forever. And of them that shall bring the sacrifice of praise unto the house of the Lord, for I will cause to return the captivity of the land, as at the first, saith the Lord. God said, I'm going to fill Jerusalem with the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. You know what he says about Babylon? The exact opposite. He says, no more in it shall be heard the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. So you know what Babylon represents? Every place where they've kicked Jesus and his church out. Sounds like what America is turning into. Sounds like what China did. China, Rush, communist Russia... Cuba, North Korea. North Korea hates the Bible. If you own a Bible, you'll go to prison the rest of your life just for having a copy of that book. They hate it. So they've expelled the voice of the bride and the voice of the bridegroom. And what's happening in this country, they want all of us Christians to keep our mouths shut. They'll kick you off YouTube and they'll kick you off Facebook if you don't follow their ever-increasing political correctness. So at some point, they'll probably run us off too. Okay? Just for saying, sodomy's a sin. And God made marriage between a male and a female and that's it for saying stuff like that. That's not correct anymore according to the world. And so they don't want us saying things like that. And we may consider it like, you know, that's bad what they're doing. But what God is doing, God's saying, okay, if you want it that way, fine. I will, I will remove the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride away from you. And you won't hear them anymore. Because you didn't want it. See, it's a blessing. I think it's a blessing where the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride are allowed to be any... I think God blesses that land. Yes. Amen? Yes. I think God blesses those people. But what's happening is they're wanting that removed. They're wanting that taken out. And Babylon is the place where the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride is no longer heard. And that's Christ and His church. That's this book, people. This is... This is you can call this our wedding band. Right? Because right here is the, the oath and the contract that you and God agreed on. The words that are in this book. Jesus said, I'll love you and I'll give you the stars of heaven. But you got to love me. Amen. Amen? And you got to love your neighbor. Amen? Amen. Boy, I got... Now we get to Isaiah 54, but it's 8 o'clock, so... You have to wait on that one. We'll start on that. Yeah, next week. We will be here next week, right? Okay. And the week after that. So the next two Wednesday nights, we will be here. All right? But think about the attack then on marriage. And what it really represents. It's not just an attack on marriage itself. It's an attack against God himself because God is the bridegroom okay